Hello, and welcome to episode eight of Duel of Security. I am Andrew. And I am deeply suspicious of the character named Ray, but I'm enjoying my, my time pretending that I'm him. That was my complicated answer for the day. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so we were just, or were we just discussing making ripples? And I think being able to express things freely is is been a huge shift for me recently. And I think I think I was I was very close to it for a while, almost like like tiptoeing around these sort of ways that I feel now. And I think there are a lot of people out there like that that are in spirituality or in have these other sort of beliefs and they've they've attached to a certain belief system that's maybe not super, super concrete as far to one side as religion, but it's it's still holding on to certain things. And I think that sort of switch comes when you're able to realize that you don't have to hold on to those things. And there's a lot of people who are still, even if they're just holding on to a few things, they don't realize how much they could benefit from letting those go as well. And so it's exciting to see, even with uh, talking to Mary yesterday and being able to, you know, have these discussions with her and she was keeping up very well with it at, at her age. It was so cool for me to see. And you mentioned that it, we were texting afterwards and I was like, it's awesome to see someone that age being able to do that. And you were like, well, I thought the same thing about you. And I was like, yeah, I guess it's all relative and it's all within our awareness. So I was almost thinking of age as just another construct and it doesn't really necessarily while you know being older and having more experiences could you know there may be more people who are just given that amount of experience can get to that point but at the same time sometimes it can happen really early and sometimes people who are older are so much farther away from it because they become so concrete yeah yeah the old expression that um you know, age begets wisdom isn't necessarily always true, right? Um, but it is certainly true that, and I think you were mentioning this in uh, the podcast that you were a uh, guest on recently, that hardship, right? The difficulty that we go through often is what inspires our awareness. It's often what wakes us up. It's going through the mess. And so it really doesn't matter what age that is. It gives us the potential to wake up to another perspective of what we're going through. I mean, when, when you're under enough pressure, you know, you're either going to get crushed or you're going to become a diamond, right? And so that's, that's very much the process. And, and it is inspiring when you see younger people cluing into it. And at the same time, you have to wonder exactly how many things in our environment are toxic, exactly how many things in, in our collective status quo are causing stress and are causing emotional turmoil that we are in fact coming to these realizations so young without any gurus, without any elders, without any shamans in our culture, right? Because that's that was the influence back in the day, right? Like we would have influence by people in this mentality that we're all one. They would come and they would talk to us and they would go, oh, well, they're still committed to their ego, you know, send them out for a, a three month spirit quest, as it were, let them rely on themselves for a bit and they'll, they'll come back with some new perspectives, but there was that guidance. And, and so we, we kind of kept growing organically that way through that guidance, through learning, you know, how to think that way. But now, now the pressure is just on all the time. It's like, uh, I think back in the thirties, the government did a study on how many uh, subjects or how many concerns the human brain can actually juggle at any given time before it starts suffering, before it starts actually like shutting down due to stress and it starts blocking out other information. I think it was like 30 to 35 things that we can juggle day to day. So when you think about taxes, bills, and you think about you know, the, the rules and the requirements of society, and you think about what's happening in politics and in religion, and then you've got our own egotistical problems where we're trying to prop ourselves up or, or we're lowering ourselves down habitually. And so we're juggling all of this stuff all the time. And you have to think, wow, no wonder, you know, all of a sudden it's like we're coming up for air. And in that moment of coming up for air, we have an insight. And that's, that's why it's so interesting to see. It, it's scary and at the same time, super inspiring. Yeah, there's, there's just so many things. Like if you really think about it, there's so many things you could worry about. And it's like, it's realizing that you don't have to worry about 
any of them if they're not here now. And if they're here now, that's not a worry. It's it's an action that you're doing. It's a situation that you're handling. And, and when it comes to that idea that I was talking about on the podcast and uh, for context, uh, I was on this podcast. Uh, it's called Today's the Future with Libby Redden uh, a couple of weeks ago, but it came out a couple of days ago. And she was asking me because she grew up uh, fairly outgoing um, and and never really dealt with she dealt with sorts of social or uh, sorts of anxiety, but never really social anxiety. And she was always, you know, came up growing up was more outgoing and more a leader type person. And she was, she was asking me why I think that so many creators similar to me or Ray, or, or even like, you know, the motivational people out there oftentimes dealt with social anxiety because she has seen that with guests on her podcast there's been a trend of people who talk about social anxiety and how to overcome it oftentimes dealt with it for a lot of their life and i my answer was i think that makes a ton of sense because it not only allows for these people to have depth but they have figured out ways to handle it and now they are sort of on this other side of the river and they're trying to help people get across because they know what it's like to be on both sides and how much more relaxing and freeing it feels to be on the other side where you don't feel socially anxious or anxious or all these negative feelings all the time and ways to deal with it. So I think it makes a ton of sense that a lot of people who discuss it went through something like that. And there's a quote I really like, I forget who it came from, but it's that suffering is necessary until you realize that it isn't. And I think that holds true in a lot of people's situations. Absolutely. Well, I know that that was one of my chief motivators for a very long time. Was, and I used to joke around about it that I had spent so much time in hell that I, I, I made a map out, right? A very carefully detailed map on how to get out. And, and so every time I see somebody who's in hell, I'm, I'm trying to share parts of the map with them, right? I'm like, hey, watch out for this part. And, you know, if you go that way, <laughs> it won't be as bad for you. And, and it's just because I, I, I spent so long there that, you know, I recognize it almost instantly. And, and it's just because it, it feels different, right? It actually feels like hell. It feels like you're disconnected from everything. And, and, and so when you suddenly find freedom, what's odd is that you're in a state where you could focus on yourself if you want to, but you almost don't want to. Now that you're free, it's like, that's all you want to do is share that feeling with everybody else. And, and I find that amazing because again, it's the flip side of selfishness, right? Because to some degree, you have to be selfish to find that freedom. And then in finding that freedom, that selfishness becomes selflessness. Yeah, and I actually use this analogy on that podcast as well, but the idea of you can only give from an overflowing cup and a lot of people who are out there, you know, trying to change the world and make the world a better place, like great. But a lot of them are trying to do that from a half full or quarter full cup. And it's like, if your cup isn't full already, all you're going to be do, it, doing is expressing all of these, all of this energy and emotions from a very not maybe fully empty, but partially empty cup. And that's just going to be expressed through that. So there's a degree of selfishness that you need to have before you can truly help others. And until that cup, until you are at that point of freedom, it doesn't mean, you know, like don't help a stranger. If you see him on the street suffering, if, if you're not fully happy yourself, I'm not talking about that, but in terms of focusing on yourself and like realizing that it's okay to be selfish with your own life and, and happiness before you start trying to help anyone else. And, and until you, that cup is overflowing, you're not going to do much good anyway. Yeah, absolutely. Cause it's going to be distorted to some degree by your own need, right? Like that, that's, that's the problem. I mean, I've met so many people. I know I used to be this person actually, where any help I, I gave was specifically for how it made me look 
it was specifically for how it changed my relationship with the person I was helping. Right. And then of course it's like, Oh, well, you know, can you help me? And Oh no, I'm busy. Well, you know, I helped you. And that's not really helping that. That's, that's, again, that's negotiating, right. That's, that's more or less manipulation. And so, yeah, it, it is difficult when your cup is not full to, to offer anything to anybody. And when you do, it's super important to be careful why you're offering it and how much you offer, right. You don't, don't go, don't go overboard and making offers you can't live up to just for the sake of feeling like you can, you can, right? And that, that's just self-honesty as well. But uh, yeah, I've met a lot of people who, who go through that phase where they're waking up. And so the first thing that they want to do is help the world. And, and somebody asked me about this on TikTok. So I just wanted to address it quickly. How do we deal with this, um, this very common sensation that happens when you start waking up to your connection to everything? that suddenly you feel like you should be saving everything. That suddenly you feel like you should be on the forefront of rescuing consciousness of, of representing the universe and trying to make social change and basically being the hero, the Messiah complex. And then, then that's often what happens as we wake up to the fact that we are the awareness of the universe because it goes part and parcel with the idea of responsibility as the awareness of the universe. But we get caught up in thinking that responsibility and control are the same thing, right? It's, we are the universe. We're responsible for how we respond in our portion of what is, but that's all our responsibility is. If you want to be a Messiah, if you want to be a hero, be the hero of your own story by setting yourself free of it. Right? And that is the only ripple. That's the most profound and meaningful ripple that you can send into the ether or into what is. And if you live that way, that ripple is continuous, it's constant. It's like a light that just keeps getting brighter and it dispels the fog around it. And so when you start to feel that way, like I need to save society, I'm looking at humanity, I see all this suffering, address your own suffering, address the suffering that you feel within yourself and, and you'll, you'll start to notice why you're focusing on the suffering around you. It's because you're still focused on the suffering within you. Mm -hmm. yeah i think i think is it gandhi that says be the change you want to see in the world yeah i think a lot of people misinterpret that quote and when they hear be the change you want to see in the world they think it it's like make the change you want to see in the world and it's like no it's literally be the expression of that like be free yourself and that's the extent of what you have to do, like actually be that change. Don't go out and change everyone else. That's what the quote is saying is like, be that change, be that freedom expressed. And people will see that and realize that it's a possibility. And, you know, maybe they'll come up to you and ask, you know, what got you to that point? And that's all great. But yeah, I think, I think a lot of people when they also with, I posted a video earlier this morning about caring what people think about you. And I think, and I hadn't really thought about it until I started filming the video that if you're, if you're, if you care a lot about what people think of you, you're expecting something out of them because you're acting in a way expecting them, or maybe not, maybe you don't want to label it as expecting, but hoping that they'll like you. So you're sort of expecting them to like you in return for the way that you're acting for them. And like, they owe you to like, they owe you to like you for the way that you're acting. And so that people catch on to that. And that is, that's why I think people are attracted more so subconsciously to authenticity because they, there isn't an expectation there. If you're being yourself for yourself, because that is how you are and how you want to be like, you're not expecting anything. You're not expecting anyone to like you for that. So people, well, it's a bit of a paradox, but people, the less you care what people, how much people like you, the more they're going to like you because of that subconscious, those subconscious feelings. And if you're acting in a way and you care a ton about what everyone thinks about you, you're subconsciously expecting them to like you in return for the way that you're acting. You're acting a specific way for their love and, and expert, like, yeah. just likes and whatever friendship and it changes your perspective love, right anything. like it's like you were saying about that quote be the change you want to see in the world you can look at that in a couple of, in, in two different ways depending on your perspective of yourself and that goes in for love thy neighbor as yourself 
right? The typical thought about that is, oh, I got to treat people the way I want to be treated. It's like, no, no, love yourself and you'll love your neighbor. See, it's love, love your neighbor as you're loving yourself while during, right? It's not, it's not treating them in any way whatsoever. It's a result of your relationship with yourself, right? So love your neighbor as you're loving yourself. It's not about treating your neighbor the way you think you want to be treated based on your ego. That's not loving yourself. And so it's always just, it's how we perceive it based on how we perceive ourselves. That's why it's, it's so the messenger is always a traitor as Krishnamurti would say, right? You can, you can word things perfectly and it won't matter if they don't have ears to hear as Jesus was saying too, right? Even Isaiah in the Bible, it says, you know, you have eyes, but you do not perceive. You have ears, but you do not hear. Yeah. And that was, that, that actually came into my head yesterday in our live stream, the ears to hear. And I think that's sort of what I was trying to get across in, like, I think I sort of expressed one side of the idea of, of people who don't necessarily agree with you, or, you know, if you have family or close friends that are just like, don't want to hear any of it, any of your questioning of everything that is, is, like if people, if someone doesn't have ears to hear, they're not going to hear until they do, no matter what you do. It doesn't mean that you shouldn't, should completely stop trying and expressing yourself in whatever ways, but it's, it's a sort of realization that people do have to come to that on their own. And it's not going to be a forced thing though. It doesn't mean you shouldn't yourself change the way that you want to be and act. And, and if you want to express things and, and try and bring people along, like that's your prerogative as well. But until they have ears to hear, they won't. That's it, right? It's, it's the parable of the seeds, right? I mean, we're just throwing seeds. That's all we're doing. And, and some seeds are, are going to catch good ground. Some of them are going to get caught up in thorns, doubt, right? Some are going to get carried away by crows, which of course are, are, are people who are trying to take advantage of it. Right. And some of them are going to grow 10 and 100 times bigger than anything else. And that, that's all Jesus was really saying. Right. But on the same token, don't throw pearls before swine. Right. Don't throw exactly. out insights that aren't appreciated. Don't don't keep trying to push, you know, the, these precious gems onto people that have no ability to recognize them as precious or useful at all. Right. And that's it. So it's finding that balance between expressing yourself because you want to and and recognizing when when you're expressing yourself because you need to so yeah. there's a bit of a balance Certainly. yeah yeah all about always about finding that balance so there are actually two things i wanted to bring up today and one of them was what we were talking about at the end of our call yesterday with the metaverse and zuckerberg that crazy dude and Facebook and, and the idea of virtual reality and, and like we might be getting there at some point soon in a world like that. And it's, I don't know, it's kind of freaky to me. I've never been that into video games really ever. Um, I don't know. I think life is more like a fun video game, but um, and in yeah, the other, and then the other thing. <laughs> Very true. Yeah, seriously. Uh, and then the other thing was, if we get to it, maybe we can save it for the next one. But uh, I want to talk about like your, your, the way that you <laughs> kind of like the way that you eat and your lifestyle with that, like if you have certain because there's so many people out there because I follow I'm sort of in the nutrition realm, health, nutrition, fitness, working out like I've always been interested in that. Um, and there's so many people out there like telling people how they should eat. And I just think that's pretty annoying. Um, like it's kind of your prerogative, how you want to eat. And I think people get really, really hung up on, you know, the nitty gritty parts instead of just keeping it at a high level, understanding like this human's going to die at some point. So you could optimize everything as much as you want for the rest of your life. And like, maybe you'll get an extra year out of this, out of this meat suit. But if, if you suffer through that eating, 
you know, a bunch of a diet you don't enjoy, then I don't see a great reason for it. But anyway, so like, those are the two things I wanted to touch on uh, at some point, but which I, one do you I want to go to first? With the, <laughs> I was going to say, I want to get to the metaverse because that is, I don't know. That's just, I, I don't know a ton about it. I don't think a ton about virtual reality, but it's not something I've ever been interested in. I've never really been interested in video games uh, and, and the idea of virtual reality kind of freaks me out that we might be moving towards a like combo type existence with that. I mean, we already kind of do to a degree, certainly with social media, but the fact that, yeah, Facebook rebranded to meta is, yeah. uh, I don't know, that's like frightening. <laughs> It's, it's kind of a continuation of a, of a habit that humanity's always had, right? Like it's not even with uh, just with social media, but so one of my first jobs was, was in a grocery store and in the grocery store, when you're running out of a product, you bring the product that's left to the front and you leave everything behind it empty, right? And it's called facing. And so what you're doing is you're just making it look like the store is full. So people have a feeling that they wouldn't if, the, if it was, everything was pushed back. Right. And, and so we do that with a lot of things, right? Repeatedly, like we're always creating a, a false reality to make ourselves feel better. And so the internet allowed us to do that to a greater degree. I mean, it's not like we haven't been playing with the idea of virtual reality for quite some time, but now we're getting to the point where we have the technology to basically create a face on reality in a way that up until now has been done through say, governmental pressure, like uh, the uh, the Olympics in China a little while back, right? There, there were whole walls that were built between the poorer areas and the richer areas in China, just so the people going to the Olympics wouldn't see those poor areas, right? Like, so right there, we're creating a reality. Again, we're facing just like we did in the grocery store. So now we have the technology to create another reality where we can pretend we are anybody we want. We can look any way we want, we can design our environment in any way we want. And although it's not real, neither is our ego. And so we can get as invested in, into it as we want to. And then of course you have the addition of NFTs now. And so all of a sudden people are going to be trading NFTs as, a, as if they are actual real goods within you know, the, the, uh, the universe that we're talking about in the metaverse. Um, and then from there on, you're going to have people that are going to continue to try and, and I guess, upgrade their inputs, how many sensations they can experience within the metaverse. And, and so it, it really is just trying to get lost in our creation again, which is the same thing that we do when we create a fiction about ourselves. And so we're, we're giving the ego its own world aside from this world, right? We're, we're actually giving it a place where it's like, no, no, you can't be yourself. You can only be the projection. You can only be you know, what you want to show other people. It's a whole other world and it's a whole other problem. But on the other hand, it's kind of cool. Like, I'm not going to argue about how cool it is. I, I, I've been around for a while. I love technology and I, and I really enjoy video games. But as always, it comes down to just because we can doesn't mean we should. But on the other, on the other hand, there's some really interesting symbolism happening here because the internet is very much symbolic of the connection that we have between one another, right? The connection that we have consciously. And so that's expressed physically in the world. And so now we have a metaverse where we're all in this space that doesn't exist, communicating with one another instantly, which is just like sharing a universal awareness to some degree. And so we're getting closer and closer and closer to trying to express, I think, the, the change in consciousness that we're experiencing. And I think that that's just coming out in technology in the same way that it's coming out in movies and in art and in conversations like this and, and, and so on. So... Yeah, I think on the one hand, it, it's, it's, it's straight up dystopian and kind of worrisome. But on the other hand, it's an interesting expression of a, of a societal change, of a collective change in our mentality that, of course, some rich person is just trying to take advantage of in the best way that he can. But, but the technology itself is, is really interesting. I mean, there's a, a crypto uh, currency that, that basically is doing the same thing, except that it's decentralized. Um, mana? I think it's, it's mana. Uh, Decentraland mana. And, and so that's also creating 
a digital universe where you have digital goods and, and you can you can interact with that, but it's decentralized in a way that Facebook wouldn't be controlling and the corporations wouldn't necessarily be able to, to dominate to, to the same degree. So my hope is that if the technology is going to continue forward and it's going to be used for something useful, that it becomes decentralized and that it, it does get taken farther away from corporate interest. I was actually looking into uh, some other, some, some of the shit coins uh, just to toss a little bit money in there on top of, I've had Bitcoin and Ethereum for a while, but I was looking at mana. Um, I, I didn't get any, but I might, that's been, everything's been down recently, but that's been exploding. That's been up like 10% every day, lost a few days. Wait it's been interesting. Yeah, yeah. It's coming, right? Because Seriously. that's what's happening. I mean, even even with the other coins, is that they're they're stabilizing, right? They, and, and this is the problem when you have so many big corporate interests or you have so many whales, is that um, they can afford to wait. And and as the price fluctuates, the people who are are hoping for a giant spike, they run across bills, they run across expenses, they have to sell, or they panic and they sell. And so you just see the the tree get shaken and all the leaves fall off, and then the the leaves that are the, the most um, firmly rooted basically the whales and everybody else who can can afford to wait it out they just stay there and then all of a sudden the next batch of investments come through or the next you know the, the next bit of hype so it's so important to try and, and wait it out with cryptocurrency especially like I, I can honestly say that if you hold on to what you have now five years from now you will not regret it regardless of how much you have now right it's just it's just a matter of time because the technology itself is the important part. It's not even the cryptocurrency in terms of it being monetary value, but it's the, it's the technology. It's it's the level of security. It's the ability to communicate so quickly and to, and to do smart contracts and everything else that might be possible as a result. So invest in the technology, if not in in the currency. Mm -hmm. How when did you first get into cryptocurrency? Has it been a while, or was it more recent? Yeah. So I, I heard about Bitcoin back in 2012, and I didn't get involved because I was learning about the economic system and the UCC, or I'd had a couple of years previously, and the World Bank and, and how you know, the Federal Reserve works and all that. And my first thought was, oh, they're going to crush this. They're going to crush it as fast as they can in the same way that they did with uh, Ron Paul's Liberty Dollar back in, I think it was like 2006, basically, it was, it was um, an alternate currency and alternate coinage that was being minted and, and used. And yeah, the, the IRS and the Federal Reserve just cracked down on that so hard um, in the same way that, you know, like, um, well, two, two presidents who have been assassinated, um, Abraham Lincoln and JFK, just happened to also be the two presidents that tried to re replace the currency and get away from the central bank's control, right? The silver dollar, the silver back and the greenback were both, you know, attempts by those presidents and, and they died as a result because there was a, a very um, strong foundational power structure here. But um, yeah, it's interesting. It, it, it's really interesting. And so to answer your question, uh, it was about 2016 and Bitcoin was still around and there was still the hype. Oh, it's being used by criminals. Oh, it's being used by the dark web, but blah, 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 blah. But all of a sudden there was more investment coming in. All of a sudden it just wasn't dying. And so it was right around there. I started doing more research. And then later on I got into Ethereum and now I actually mine Ethereum out of my house. So that's pretty cool. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, I got in. I had a friend who's I think I've mentioned it before. He's like crazy about Bitcoin, doesn't believe in anything. He's very much like staunch in his bitcoin beliefs like thinks everything else is bullshit and he'll only ever get bitcoin um so he uh he texted me and my other friend last summer of 2020 he was like do you guys have bitcoin and i was like no like i just made some other investments in like some other stocks some companies had been looking at and that was my reason why and he's like you're both idiots <laughs> i was like <laughs> like and then I gave my excuses, like just invest. And he's like, yeah, fine, fine. But like, and so after that, I was like, all right, maybe there is something to this. And I was lucky, like I've always been relatively open about things. He, he's one of those kids that's sort of like Bitcoin is his personality. So he brings it up with everyone all the time. Uh, he's gotten better because we, we would just give him so much shit for it. But um, most of my friends, I think I was the only one because I went in 
heavy. Like I went down the rabbit hole and saw, and this was, I think it was still, still pretty low. It was like around 10 or 11 back then. And I went down the rabbit hole and I was like, oh, wow. And I, then I saw like the stock to flow charts and I was like, oh, this isn't just a random spike. This is very, very structured. And that was, that was the key for me. And I was just like, you know, maybe everything goes away and this crashes to zero, but if this actually follows this path, I'm willing to lose this amount of money that I, that I put in, because I think there's a pretty darn good chance that it does follow this eventually. And, and so that was my thinking, but it didn't, it didn't really matter whether I got in before then, cause I didn't have that much money anyway. Like I was still in college back in, you know, even through 2018 is when I graduated. So I didn't have hardly any money to my name to do anything with. So it kind of came at a good time, I guess, but yeah. That's fair. Yeah, no, it's uh, Bitcoin is, Bitcoin's going to be around for a while because it was, it's the biggest name in cryptocurrency. But I mean, if we're going to be honest about it, the, the reason that people are behind Bitcoin is because it's deflationary because of exactly the stock to flow ratio that you're talking about and, and, and because there is so much investment in Bitcoin. But on the other hand, Bitcoin is incredibly slow and it takes a lot of power. And, and the fact is, is that the, the mining, the deflationary mining process that Bitcoin uses is going to start losing some of its luster as we start getting towards 2050 and 2060, right? As we start getting closer and closer to that end date where there is no Bitcoin left to mine. And that's going to change everybody's opinion and it's going to change how everybody uses Bitcoin as, as the mining becomes more and more scarce. As much as it's going to drive up the value, it's also going to drive up how we interact with that. And so that's very exciting to me. But on the other hand, it's also why I looked at the Ethereum network, why I looked at not just the proof of work, uh, proof of work uh, algorithms, but the proof of stake uh, options as well, because proof of work is great, but again, it uses a lot of energy. It uses a lot of, a lot of input or a lot of processing power. And I know, because at one point I was doing some research into starting a, a mining facility with a couple of friends and, um, uh, yeah, it's it's noisy. It takes a lot of power. There's, there's a lot of consequences around it and not, not every, um, uh, municipality or every region even wants a Bitcoin mining facility in, in, in their area. So um, Bitcoin's going to have its own stumbles, whereas the proof of stake concept is actually really cool. Whereas you, you're, you're staked in there, that, that's what's keeping it going, right? It's, it's just keeping everybody working on, on the same blockchain as it were. I really enjoy that concept. And uh, for that reason, I, I'm in uh, Ethereum. And of course, you've got uh, Cardano. And uh, I, I don't I don't invest in Ripple very often, though I do pop in and out of it as it fluctuates up and down. Um, so there's just there's just a lot of coins to keep an eye on. But um, I, I enjoy watching the community based coins, because at the end of the day, I think that that's what I support the most about cryptocurrency is that it can be so easily used and, and promoted by the people that are a part of that community. I think that uh, well, well, this is like uh, the crypto cities that the inventor of Ethereum has been talking about recently. Have you heard about those? I haven't. No. So basically, they're they're and um, I, I encourage you to go look it up. It's crypto cities, and basically, it's just an idea of developing communities that are using cryptocurrencies in order to facilitate trade within that community. So the community has its own cryptocurrency, and then as that that cryptocurrency is traded some of the, the dividends or some of that cryptocurrency goes towards the maintenance of that, that community, right? So it's a way of basically distributing wealth within the community and making sure all of the, the social needs are met without actually representing it as taxes or, or giving it to a representative government. So it's a really interesting idea. And I think it goes in the, in the direction that we want to go, but unfortunately it's still using capitalism it's still using the idea of, of monetary exchange and so there's still going to be that capacity for corruption and so are those are those crypto communities are they virtual or are they like real they're real this is what they're trying to do there, there was uh one in the states i was looking at yesterday i can't remember the name of it but uh basically you know, you go, you, you invest in it, and then you're given a certain degree of cryptocurrency and there's a store and there's everything else and it's all built into the community. So everybody is working with this cryptocurrency as opposed to the fiat currency that we typically use day to day. Now, I don't know how well that's going to, to be applied because obviously 
you're still living within a country that uses fiat currency. And as I mentioned earlier about the Fed and the IRS, they're not going to really like the idea of entire communities not using fiat currency, right? Because that, that, that's going to hurt the economy. But I like the idea. Yeah, yeah, very interesting. Uh, There's something else I, that came to mind. Uh, oh, with uh, with Robin Hood, when they what were what were your thoughts when they uh, what was it was it Doge when they didn't allow people to sell? Like that just seemed to me like such a such a fucked up thing that they did, but also yeah. not surprising if they have that yeah. control, but oh, man. Well, it's interesting. Cause I, like I was saying earlier about uh, shaking the tree, right. And th these larger exchanges really have that power to, to, to hype something up and then to let it drop. I mean, that's what they did with Shiba. They kind of entertained the idea of like, we're going to list Shiba. And then they're like, Oh no, we're not really going to list Shiba. Um, another exchange did that. The Shiba community basically dropped the reviews down to like one star. They just came out in force. Um, so there is, there's kind of a backlash that's forming through the involvement of these communities, but yeah, it, what Robin Hood's done and, 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 and it's not just Robin Hood, obviously is, is within their own best interest. And I, I think that it's because they're positioning themselves in a way that when they do, list certain coins they are invested in those coins that they're already ready to benefit from it and, and if they're holding off on it it's probably to let the tree shake a bit so that way it can consolidate and the price can drop and then they can invest and then they'll go hey we're listing it now and it'll go through the roof yeah yeah oh man there's so much of that out there and i think i mentioned this before but when you know big uh like fed not fed people but like big corporate CEOs will, you know, talk shit about Bitcoin and how it's, you know, it's going to go to zero and it's worthless. And then, you know, you see some big people investing in it all of a sudden, like right after that dip because of, you know, their influence. And it's just like, ah, it's so gross, but right. it is what it is. Yeah, yeah. In this, in the society that we have right now, right? Like that, that's it. Is yeah. that, we live in a society that that very much makes this kind of selfishness and greed possible and doable, right? Like that, that's that's the whole thing is that it's it's very easy in this society to just think about yourself, put yourself first and and, and just hoard. Um, and of course, because our society doesn't necessarily encourage a, a mentality that that is fulfilled and happy on its own, we really have that need to continue to to compare and compete and hoard. And so I think that as we move away from that, and again, cryptocurrency is a part of that, but so is this conversation. And so a great many other uh, improvements in the world in terms of technology and, and whatnot. Um, I think that we're eventually going to get away from that. But, and, and I know this is probably one of my least popular opinions. Uh, we're never going to fix this until we evolve past money. We're, we're just not. And it's because there's no point there's no need for it except to make sure that I get my check, right? Like it's just to make sure that I, I get what, what I want in exchange and, and, to, and to monitor that. But the fact is, is that if we recognized, truly recognized that we are one, that this planet is us and that we're all in this together, there would be no need for money. And there would be a common awareness that we put in for everybody's benefit. Right. And then we all benefit as a result. And that would change our work days. That would change everything. It would change how we, we, we produce things. It would change how we distribute things. It would change how we use things. But we have to get to that point. Otherwise, it doesn't matter if we're using cryptocurrency. It doesn't matter if we go back to a barter system. We're still catering to our division. We're still catering to the mechanism in our mind, which will always want more because it compares and it competes. So we just, we need, to, we need to let money go at the same time as we let go of our overcommitment to this division. Yeah, that was one of the biggest insights I had with when I first tried uh, mushrooms was like the realization that I don't need, like I have, I, I had already, you know, realized that in a lot of ways for a while, like I am very grateful and remember just like constantly how much I have, even 
you know, having a functional body is like something I keep in mind all the time. And I think that when you're able to, although it seems basic to be able to see and hear, it's like, how much would that change your life if you weren't able to do that? And, and so then on top of that, it's like, there's so many cool things you can do just being a human, like so many cool things, like being able to, I think when I was making the video about my first experience, I was like, I'm staring at a computer, talking with my mouth, making words into a microphone that I'm going to download and then put on the internet for probably hundreds or thousands of people to see like that in itself, like what we're doing right now, having a conversation from like, I don't know, 3000 miles away in different countries is really cool in itself. And so realizing that it's, and because I think both of us don't feel, you know, a lot of that lack that is pushed through our society through, you know, and that's kind of what advertising is built off of the, the sense of lack and, and need for more and that you aren't enough until you have this or until you get this or until you buy this or, or whatever. And and the whole keeping up with the Joneses mentality. Um, But until people start to realize, I guess, and you know, who knows when it'll happen as a collective that there are, you know, you are enough right now here. And now you are whole and complete exactly as you are right now. There's nothing you can ever possibly do to gain or lose anything from the awareness, which you are until then. Yeah. It's, it's going to keep on chugging. <laughs> and, and it's funny because as much as we focus on modifying our society to, to, you know, kind of bring in this golden era, like uh, developing green technologies and talking about, you know, new systems of government and changing um, electoral reform, things like that. Right. Um, that's all external. Right. That's all external. And if we don't change how we perceive ourselves and how we perceive each other, then it doesn't matter what kind of system we, we create. We will corrupt it. We will always bring it back down to the same, to the same, you know, selfish uh, motivators that, that it's in right now. And so we have to do both at the same time. It's great to invent, to invent green technologies. And it's great to talk about, you know, a resource-based uh, economy or resource-based government, but if we're still taking our need to compete with us, then that's all going to fall apart. I mean, Krishnamurti was actually talking about the fact that until we can figure out how to work together, it's not going to work. And he's, and, and if we see people working together all the time, say uh, on a building, for example, to create a building or to build a business or, or, or anything like that. But each of those people, as long as they're focused on their idea themselves, is focused on their own individual goal. They're doing it for their own reasons. And so they're not actually working together. They're not sharing a common intention. They're, and, and, and our economy, our system makes it so much easier to do that because everybody's just paid to be there instead of wanting to be there. Right? And so it changes how, how we interact a, a, as a species. And, and so, yeah, I, I think it's gonna be, our environment's gonna change as our internal changes. And then hopefully somewhere in the middle, we'll realize that our environment is our internal. Yeah. Yeah. It's almost like, like no matter what system we choose, maybe there are some systems that may exist in this reality in a better way for the collective, but it's still, if we still have these beliefs about ourselves, and it's still rooted in our perception of division and duality, then it doesn't really matter which system is there because it's like you said it's not within it's all without right but we'll compare systems of government we'll go oh democracy is better than socialism which is better than communism it's like but any one of those systems that was you know uh, adopted by a mentality of unit of unity adopted by a mentality of awareness would work Right. They would they would make that system work. They would adapt it to do so. Right. But we're like, oh, it's the structure of the system. It's like, but we're egotistical people using that system. Right. It's kind of like blaming a car when somebody drives the car who doesn't know how to drive. Right. It's, it's not the car's fault. 
you you don't know what you're doing. You're the one causing damage, right? So we have to take that on. We have to realize that no no idea, no matter how good the idea is, will ever fix the problem if we don't have the awareness to actually implement it properly. I have a question. So not that I don't always have questions, but when it comes to, I feel like there's certain societies that are more, homogenous than the United States, um, or Canada or wherever. I just always related to the U S uh, like, I think, you know, Norway and, uh, Northern European that it seems like their systems just work a little bit better than ours in a lot of, in a lot of different ways. Do you think it's could be because they almost, because they don't, look as different or feel as different that they feel maybe not like completely unified, but more of a unity. Whereas a place like the U S is so divided in, you know, every different way that we could possibly imagine, like where it is reinforced into us that we are divided and separate and different. And you need to treat this person this way because they look like this or, you know, feel like this or they're, you know, this gender and you got to be careful and, and all these things. Whereas a society that maybe doesn't have as much surface level divisional type feelings, it's a little bit easier because of that sort of level of feeling of unity. I'm curious what you're I think there's a portion of that for sure. I I think that a a large portion of it is also the the history of those countries. They're, They're far older than the United States. I mean, when, when we look at the history of, of mankind or the history of just of, of the different countries that have existed in the last 10,000 years, the United States and Canada are, are infants at the end of the day, right? And, and they were created out of violence you know, at the end of the day. So that, that contributed to a lot of the division, especially in, in the United States in, in terms of, of slavery. And of course, what, what happened to the, the, with the indigenous and um, even just the war against Britain to get it's independence, right? Like there's a, there's a, a long history of division within the United States. Um, whereas within Northern Europe, I mean, outside of being conquered by Rome and then being, you know, uh, being kind of in the middle of World War I and II, that area of the world has been around and, and fairly stable for a long period of time. They have a culture, they have a certain way of doing things and, and that, that way of, of doing things has evolved. Like um, Iceland, for example, is super progressive. And, and they are almost so removed from the system that they've just decided we're gonna make the system what we want it to be, right? Like back in 2008, when the, the economic collapse happened and the bankers were you know, basically just messing with the system and re- enriching themselves, Iceland was one of the first ones to go, yeah, no, we're not, we're not paying any of this money to crooked bankers and we're not, we're not doing any of that. In fact, we're gonna replace our entire parliament and they got rid of their, their prime minister and, and elected their first lesbian woman prime minister that day, I think it was, or something ridiculous. And it was just like, no, we're not playing that. And so Europe actually declared Iceland to be a terrorist state for a very short period of time because Iceland would not participate in the monetary fraud that was being perpetuated by the global governments, right? That same fraud that was, you know, um, uh, basically hammering Greece and ha- hammering all these European countries, you know, with um, the, the uh, oh God, what's the word I'm looking for? Basically reining back spending, right? Just cutting back social services, cutting back all of these pensions, everything else. And Iceland's just like, no, nope, we're not doing that because all of this money you say we owe to you people was based on a con and we're not, we're just not doing it. And so I was super impressed with that in itself, but it's also their, their um, perspective of what's important. And, and it's in quite a few European countries. I don't know about um, other countries in the world because I'm, I'm not familiar with everything, but when it comes down to some European countries, you get two hour breaks for lunch. Um, you get paid, paid vacation time for like three months out of the year or something like that. Like there, there are different priorities in terms of why we're here and what we're doing, right? The, the companies out there typically take care of their of their their staff differently. The governments, although there is a higher um, a higher tax rate, those taxes go into say paid maternity leave, right, and things like that. So it's a different priority, and I think that that's largely because of the longer history as well. Whereas you know in North America we had that manifest destiny 
um, thing, which is basically like, I can get anything I want. That's what's important to me. And so everything in our economy and everything in our, in our society is based around that importance, that priority, where I think when you've been around for you know, a couple of thousand years and you've, you've suffered through revolutions and you've suffered through wars with your neighbors and, 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 and family and friends and everything else that you start to reprioritize things to some degree. But our culture in North America hasn't really been hammered by any other country, if you think about it. I mean, we pissed some countries off, right? And we've kind of had some political upheaval from a distance, but it's not like anybody's ever attacked North America after we did. I mean, I mean, and since we took over North America, it's not like we've ever been attacked here. We had a bit of, of a skirmish between Canada and the U.S. for a bit, but that, that, that was really the only thing, right? And then 9-11. Yeah, yeah, damn. Yeah, the, those priorities sound pretty, pretty awesome. I mean, there are days that I, I take an hour and a half for lunch just because no one says anything when I do. <laughs> but um, yeah, that idea of, of Iceland be, being declared a terrorist uh entity for that just if that doesn't drive home the idea that there is no good or bad and and it's all perception to someone like i don't know what does because they weren't willing to be involved in this schemey like money hungry ordeal they were deemed a terrorist organization which is like in most people's mind, the epitome of evil and, and bad. And it was just because of that, they were deemed that. And like, that's absolutely outrageous. I, I didn't know that was, that happened. That. <laughs> yeah. yeah, absolutely. Well, and I mean, it's, there are so many things to consider when we, when we talk about who gets deemed a terrorist state or who gets deemed evil in the world. Right. Like, and, and why, because it, so this is a conversation I don't typically get into because it's so tempting to want to blame people in power for the evil in the world, whereas people in power are just enacting, you know, the the uh, the parts of their awareness that the system makes possible. Yeah, that's very your idea that uh that idea of blaming and and not blaming those in power for for the actions that they take or or whatever with the system. I actually had a friend I've, I've mentioned him before who, who just like questions a lot of things. And we have pretty good discussions. He was my old roommate, but he, uh, I was going on a rant about how politicians are all just like short-term thinkers. They don't think about the long-term and blah, blah, blah. Just getting into that, just like kind of ranting, talking about it for a while. And he was like, well, can you blame them? You know, they have four year terms or two year terms like the system is built for them to think in the short term and their goal is that's their job. So their goal is reelection. So, of course, they're focused on reelection and short term thinking because long term thinking isn't going to have enough of an impact to get them reelected. And so they it's almost like that's part of the system. And I was like, oh shit, I, didn't, I wasn't thinking about that side of it, but that makes a lot of sense. And I think it ties into the idea of like, can you really blame them for thinking short-term? Like, is it really their fault or are they just a product of their environment? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Which is, I mean, like this, the same can be true for um, say the, the police force and, and, and the increasing violence and brutality that, that is involved in the police force. And it's like, you, you have an organization that has a very short period of training, right? And offers authority and, and a gun to people who might very much need authority and a gun. And, and that, that's a danger, right? Like there should be some degree of a psychological test involved. Like I've often said people in power should be the people who don't want to be in power, right? They're the ones who shouldn't want to use that. And so it's funny that we have a system of government where we literally elect the people who want it the most, right? And who are willing to pander the most to every crowd, who are willing to change what they say and what they think to get the most, the most votes behind them. And so they want it so bad. And that's why we have no integrity within our system at all. And, and so again, going back to cryptocurrency, I, I would love to see us adapt a local governmental model where everybody has the ability to vote in real time on every issue within that local government, right? And, and why couldn't we do that? Why do we need to have elections every four years where we vote for somebody based on their promises and our assumptions, and then we don't get a say for another four years? Yeah. 
that that's an act of blind faith and stupidity. Yeah, it's, it is, it is just, it's almost comedic the way that, especially, I mean, especially recently in the U S with our elections and, and the debates, like it's, it's like absolutely ridiculous to watch that. Like these are our best options. It's like, Oh, I don't even want to go to the polls. Like, oh my God. And, and I've actually had discussions with some of my friends who think similarly to me and are kind of just like, definitely not extreme on either side at all. Just kind of see that both sides have some things they are probably right about some stuff they're probably wrong about. And the, it's more so just the, the system and idea. And we were talking about uh, like the people who want to get elected and how it seems like we're picking from like maybe the bottom 60%, like the, out of all the people in the country who would be a great president, the top like 30 to 40% want nothing to do with it. So we're starting from the 60th percentile. And then probably from there, it's like 50 to 60. People are too in the middle. They're not extreme to get through the primaries. So then really for the presidential election, we're starting with like the bottom 50%. And it's just absolutely insane because, you know, the people, like all the people I know who would probably make for these in president, even just like close to me in my life that would never come close. They're not in politics or anything like they're all like, that is the last job I would ever want to have in my life. And I think the same, like that is, I would never want to take part in that or really politics at all. It's just, uh, it's such a schemy, messy business. <laughs> yeah. Because there's, there's very little honesty in it. It's, it's all, it's all pandering. Right. And, and it's, it's largely because I mean, that the culture that we have is, is looking to be pandered to. And so as we had that, that need to be pandered to, politicians clued in, pandered to us, and the loop just kept getting worse and worse and worse until now. It's just saying what we want to hear. That's it. It's not even, it's not even a platform anymore. It's not even about actual you know, policy decisions so much as just policy promises. We don't really get into the details and the details are scattered at best. It's like, well, what is your plan for that? It's like, oh, well, we got this great you know, 20 page plan that we're gonna go through, but we know the minute we bring this to the house floor that it's gonna get ripped apart. And none of this is actually gonna see the light of day ever, but we're not gonna say that to you right now because I want you to vote for me. And this sounds really, really good. It just goes back to the same stuff we've been talking about, about the manifestation industry, right? It's like, if I tell you the whole truth, then you actually have to think about things, right? <laughs> and, and that means you may not like what I'm telling you and you may not do what I want you to do. And, and it's like, if we're going to run our society, whether it be local or otherwise, we have to do it from a state of mind where we're willing to look at the things we don't like, where we're willing to actually measure and weigh the information without you know, identifying with us somewhere in that process. So that way we can actually make a decision that's based on clarity. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I know. It's, uh, I don't know. I, I, I don't know if uh, really what, I don't know even where I would start. I don't know. Do you have any ideas where you would start if you were given, given the reins with things? <laughs> yes. Yes, I do. Yeah. Um, and, and it's just, and, and this isn't to say that I know the answer, but I, I know one of the biggest answers and this has been observed by even presidents in the United States who, who were noted to be visionaries like Abraham Lincoln, for example, and JFK, who both surrounded themselves with people who disagreed with them, right? And they did so, so they could get a more rounded picture of what everybody wanted, of what was all the possibilities. And so I think that that would be the biggest thing would be recognizing that just because you're in charge, <laughs> doesn't mean you know everything, right? And that you should, in fact, you know, get as many opinions as you can. Um, but yeah, I would do certain things that would change things. So the first thing I would do is get rid of, an, of a federal government in the way that it's run right now. I would, I would very much strip things down to a local government level and then have those local governments integrated with other local governments in, in a cryptocurrency blockchain type of fashion where everybody is monitoring their resources and productivity, but that the blockchain is used then 
to make sure that those resources and what's being produced are distributed evenly and simply among all of those communities, right? So to make sure that everybody has enough and that there, if there is any excess, that it's evenly distributed. And I, I think that would be one part of it. But um, another part of it, and this is gonna be the biggest problem, is that as long as we are participating in this system, and I know after, after the last podcast where we were talking a bit about contract law and the UCC and, and, and how we all are, uh, all are kind of agreeing to this through our identity, through our person, um, a, lo a lot of people ask, like, how do we get out of this? And there are a lot of people that are trying. There, there are a lot of people who are trying to use the UCC and they're trying to use the law in order to you know, um, expatriate, they're, they're trying to basically cancel out the contract that they're, they've agreed to based on the fact that not all the details were provided when we quote unquote agreed to this contract. But basically what they're trying to do is leave the corporation of their country so they can be free. Problem is, is that you are still then using land and property and items and, and, and everything else, including fiat currency of that corporation. So you are still intrinsically agreeing to use that corporation, whether whether you want to or not. So a big portion of this is, is going to be that there has to be enough of us wanting to walk away. And then once there's enough of us, and I genuinely want to see this happen, I would love to see a global strike. A global strike from enough people would shut this system down. All of a sudden, they'd have to negotiate. They would have to negotiate. And the only thing we'd have to stick with is, no, you're not in charge anymore. We're going to figure out our own way, right? And so that global strike would have to be ongoing for quite some time, which means that you would have to have some degree of organization. For example, you would have to have property owners that are willing to provide sanctuary for people who are part of this. You would also have to be, have people who are providing food or who are uh, growing food or who, who have access to food and resources willing to share those food and resources. And so you could have everybody who agrees to do this on one day to sell all of their fiat currency, all of their stuff and just stockpile reserves of food and whatnot and, and supply chains with these property owners, with indigenous tribes, with everything else. And then just, yeah, a month of, we're just gonna sit here until you give up. I think it would work. I think it'd be great. And all we'd have to do is just refuse to identify because even if they came onto the property and arrested you, if you don't identify yourself, they have to let you go eventually, right? That's the whole point. And how many people can they arrest? Think about it. How many people can they arrest before those jails start filling up? How many people can they incarcerate overnight before they can't fit people in anymore? So eventually the system would just collapse through us refusing. It would be a no thank you re revolution. Just no thank you, we're done now. No violence, no bloodshed, nothing like that. It wouldn't even be a revolution. It would just be a collective agreement by enough of our awareness that this has got to change. I would love to see that. <laughs> yeah, that would be, be pretty cool. So you said non-violent, but I feel like, I feel like like maybe the uh, collective awareness that was saying no thank you wouldn't get violent but maybe on the other side they would and they would and and that's it and and that's the the one reason that it has to be a no thank you revolution we, there almost has to be an understanding that there's going to be suffering through this transition that that we are going to be arrested we are going to be beaten we are going to be oppressed we are they are going to try and, and crack down on us and we have to be willing to accept the nature of our awareness which is that you can take everything from me except the inch i'm not willing to give you and that's it is that we have to be willing to take the hit we have to be willing to suffer and, and indeed even die for it if, if it's really worth it to us and if it's not worth it to us then we have nothing to complain about as we as this raging dumpster fire really starts to ignite yeah yeah mm. yeah i mean i don't know do you think do you think there's enough people who are close to uh these I think that's what we're a part of. organizations i think that's what we are a part of i think that's what the people who are listening to this podcast are a part of and the people who are having similar conversations are a part of, and I've been watching it grow over my lifetime alone. And I know it's been growing a lot longer than that. Like there's clear evidence that we've been oscillating in and out closer and closer to this truth as we continue as a species. So 
Yeah, we're getting there. I don't know if there's enough people right now. I mean, in, in all honesty, I haven't mentioned any of this on our podcast up until now because it's a conversation that you have to have with people who see things in a certain way because anybody else is going to just resist and say, you know, like, well, the system system's protecting you. Like when I posted a, a video from our last podcast the other day about the UCC and contract law, somebody wrote back, well, at least we're not German or Japanese referencing world war two. Right. Like it's like, see, the system is protecting us. And, and there's that cognitive dissonance again. Right. It's the same people who will say that that there's no racism in the police. Right. And, and it's because I don't want to see that. That ruins the illusion that keeps me feeling safe. Right. And so that's that's that that whole thing of pearls before swine. That, that, that's a that whole thing of, of choosing who you talk to about this to a certain degree, because some people are not going to take it well and they're going to feel threatened by it not because you're threatening them but because they're holding on to something that makes them feel threatened yeah yeah that idea of the police something i think about a lot now too especially when it comes to like drug use and and whatnot that it it's crazy like there's got to be police officers who have done illegal drugs and yet they're the authority that or the dea or whatever that you know, confiscates them and does drug busts and all of this. It's like, if they're, they've done it before, it's just crazy that they're humans no differently than anyone else. And yet they're given a badge and now they're able to enforce these laws. And I guess they're just enforcing the laws that are created, but it's still so strange. Right. I mean, that's the thing is that they're enforcing. So it's against the law to kidnap somebody, right? But if you go out and try, cop comes over and kidnaps you. Because yeah. they're allowed, right? So to enforce the laws, we, 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 we empower people to break those laws. And, and so it's like, hmm, I can't imagine why this keeps going so badly. Yeah. I, used to, I used to think about that more with like speeding. You know, like what if a cop's speeding? You know, and they're not on duty or something, or they know where the other cops are. So like they could speed whenever they want. That's how I used to think when I was younger, I would think about that and wonder about that all the time. I was like, damn, I guess it's kind of, kind of cool, but also kind of fucked up. <laughs> and it goes back to that whole, you don't question a rule that your authority is derived from. Right. I mean, that's the thing. When, when you're in power, you don't question what, what gave you that power. You just use the power. Right. And if you do question what gave you the power, then you quickly start to strip it away and look at why you need to feel powerful. And, and, and that's it. That's why you'll see, um, well, there's been more than a few uh, people who have gotten into politics and then quickly realize that you can't change the system from within and quit. There are people who've joined the military, people who've joined the police force and otherwise who you know, have, have went to jail over, you know, re refusing to fight in the military or, or have just straight up quit their job in the police force for refusing to do what they were ordered to do. And, and it's because there is something intrinsically wrong. And when we know that we, we don't want to be in there, but that, then that means that as long as those institutions are around and the people who are aware enough to leave those systems aren't part of them, that we continue to get a more and more corrupted system of people who aren't aware. And then we wonder why those systems continue to, to perform in more and more uh, inhumane ways. And it's because we're, we're packing them full of people who are in a mentality that's just not aware enough to really question it. Yeah. Yeah, there was a kid who became, <laughs> I was, uh, I had a couple of my friends from high school uh, visit me if, uh, a month or so ago and we were talking about kids from our high school class and, you know, what they're up to now. And one kid uh, who was kind of like a total shithead, like became, we were, we were like, what happened to him? And you're like, oh, well, he's a police officer now. And we were, we were all like, oh no, like, God damn it. <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's so interesting how the people or even, I think I see this with a lot of baseball coaches. Like I played baseball from when I was five years old to 23 years old. And I saw that a lot of 
coaches, especially at the college level, and you know, even for mid-major division one, who just like shouldn't have been baseball coaches. And there's so many people out there who would be great coaches, but the people who shouldn't be there who have like are like egomaniacs and just kind of assholes who are not good because especially where I was, because it was like a pretty good school. So a lot of kids were very focused. A lot of them didn't knew they weren't going to continue and play professional baseball. They didn't really have dreams of that. Whereas other schools do, there's a certain type of kid that just is attracted to one school or the other. And so, but my coaches like expected everyone to just be like more baseball focused and school focused. And so it's like, not only are you not a great coach, but like for this sort of situation with kids who like do well in school and there's a reason they got into this school like baseball is a part of it but a big part they know they're not gonna play baseball forever they're very aware of that and they just wouldn't connect those dots and there's so many situations just the people who would be great at a certain role want nothing to do with it and those who should have nothing to do with it are the ones who are doing it (laughs) exactly exactly like um I have a tendency when I, when I'm in a group of people working on something of just being the kind of the linchpin, I'm just like, okay, how can I help here? And how can we help it? Let's, 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 let's collaborate on that. Let's figure this out. And I just happen to take on that role all the time. And it's because nobody else is because if somebody else does, I'm happy to just sit back and let that shit happen. Right. I'm just like, you go ahead. I'm good. Let me know how I can help. And that's it. But if nobody's doing it, then immediately I feel compelled to, to jump in and try and help out to whatever capacity I can. And so I've been told that I have good leadership skills, but I don't want to lead, right? In the same way, I don't want followers. I, 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 I just want to do my own thing. And, and because of that, when I am in a leadership capacity or in a leadership role, there's no need for it. There's no, you know, I'm, I'm higher than you. I'm telling you what to, you got to listen to me, right? And it's just because we're just working together. I'm just playing this role because that's what's necessary right now, right? And, and then that's it. But yeah, we end up with a lot of roles that people shouldn't be in. But again, our culture doesn't care about that. Our culture promises money and stability. I mean, how many people have, have do you know that went to school specifically for the money and the stability without ever thinking to themselves, you know, what does my soul want to do? You know, what do I actually enjoy? Yeah, more than 50%, for sure, without a doubt, if not, you know, 80%, especially at my school. But yeah, it, it is kind of a, a funny paradox. And, and also with your, you know, whatever role you take on in whatever situation, it's like you don't take it seriously and you don't identify as that. And that's the thing, too, is people who are, you know, leaders they identify as being a leader and they take it so seriously and and figure out you know they try and say exactly what a leader should say instead of just saying what they will say and it's it's so many things are just half-assed backwards yeah yeah exactly exactly and and it's so funny because we we get conned into these things we get so caught up in thinking about thinking in ways that makes all of this corruption and all of this this uh, systemic problem possible but it's conversations like this that that start to to dispel that is conversations like this that that really put us in a mindset where we are willing to look where we are where we actually see not just the benefit of of looking and questioning but kind of the fun and the enthusiasm that goes with looking and questioning as well i've had so many conversations or so many uh comments from people while we've been running this podcast over the last seven episodes about how they're so grateful this conversation is happening, how it's a conversation that they, they want to have with other people but can't find, or it's conversations they've had with themselves, right? Or it's a conversation that they, they, they talk to others and people don't listen. And so all of a sudden, they're able to listen to this podcast and they're able to have this discussion with us. And that's awesome. That's a part of the whole change. That's, that's exactly it. And I just wanted to say quickly, if you have listened to the, ep- the seven episodes before this podcast, I'm so glad you're here. I'm so proud of you for making it through all of this content with us because this is big stuff. We're, we're questioning everything. We're shaking the very foundation of our existence. And that's, that's a big deal, but we're doing it because 
it's fun to do. And if we can chat with you about anything, that's what we want to do. Anything and everything we want, just, just cover it for the sake of, of putting it out in the open, looking at it openly without the need for an, for an answer or the need to identify with it. And so um, I just want to say this one more time. If you can, if you're interested in chatting with us one-on-one -on -one in a group setting, we have uh, a Zoom room that we have with our Patreon supporters. We had one yesterday. So much fun. We had one of our supporters come in and get on the screen with us. We were able to talk back and forth with her, answer some questions, and hear about how her journey is going. And, and so the, the Zoom room that we uh, have for our supporters can hold up to 100 people right now. You can get on screen if you'd like to. And then, of course, other supporters will be able to listen to your insights and the things that you've learned. And so I can't recommend that enough. If you're interested in joining that conversation, definitely join us on Patreon. Yeah. Yeah. I'm excited for that to start to grow and have those monthly live zoom streams, you know, when it gets to a hundred people, that'll be just so much fun. And, um, yeah, super excited for that. But yeah, I think with the podcast too, it's just, it's cool. Cause it's something that we enjoy just doing and having this conversation like we don't have any expectations going into it with sort with any of the discussions that we're having whether it's a workshop or a podcast or a live stream we don't really have like a ton of preparation that goes into it like a tiny bit for the workshop at least you know we have a topic <laughs> that we're going to cover but uh for these there certainly isn't any and it's just a discussion for the sake of having a discussion like there is no which is sometimes like it feels weird in our society to do something without an expectation or you know without trying to you know better yourself or improve yourself or or get to this point or the peak of the mountain it's just having it for the sake of having it and that's what sort of life is life is happening for the sake of happening it is is having the experience itself is the the reason the reason is here and now always and and so i think it's cool that we're able to sort of express that in this uh avenue and way through just having conversations via via zoom <laughs> yeah well it's funny a, a friend of mine was asking like well don't you you plan what you're going to talk to before the pod, you know, talk about during the podcast. And I'm like, no. Uh, and it's the reason is because while we're talking about a certain mentality, while we're talking about a certain state of being, it wouldn't make sense to not embody that state of being. Right. So, so we just go into these podcasts and we're just like, I wonder what awareness is going to do today. And we just allow ourselves to do it, reminding our listeners and ourselves at the same time that that's what we're always doing allowing ourselves to do things right and and so yeah I, I find it funny that the process of making the podcast or or being ourselves in making the podcast is the subject matter we're talking about on the podcast yeah yeah it's like the the show don't tell mentality and yet we're sort of doing both like we're talking about it as we're showing it as well and i just yeah i find it so so enjoyable and exciting yeah well that's it right is i i i do this regardless right it, what i'm enjoying about this is that we're able to put this in a format and in front of people who are looking for it right as opposed to me just walking around my life occasionally stumbling stumbling across, across somebody who has an interest and just mentions it we're actually just throwing seeds out there and, and people can find them when they need them i think that's great it makes me really happy. Um, before we wrap up, because we're coming up to an hour and a half already, um, you had a question about food, I think. <laughs> yeah, I was thinking. I was thinking maybe we can save that for uh, for next podcast. But that is something because we've never really talked about it. It was something. It hit me today. Uh, I was walking home from the gym, and I was like, I wonder how what Ray's diet is like, <laughs> and and because that's I don't know. I just see it like I follow a lot of uh, health and fitness related people who have uh, different mindsets than me, but also some of them have similar mindsets, and I'm. It just is interesting how much shit is out there and how much. BS that people have and how much, how many people are out there like trying to use their way of eating as a way to make money and like kind of 
instilling this fear in people that if they don't, you know, eat a certain way that they're going to die young and, and all this crazy shit. Or like red so meat makes you aggressive. Yeah. Like anything. It's like, it's not that it's like simpler than people think. And it's, it goes, it's the same with, you know, what we discuss on here, like it's simpler than people think when it comes to, you know, fitness and working out, it's simpler than people think, but people like to overcomplicate it because it's a lot easier to make money when you re-explain, when you complicate a process and then explain it and, and try and get people to think that they need you because it's so complicated, but you know how to do it. So then they have to follow you when in reality, it's not, that it's like we put all this stuff on top of it where if you just peel it back and and you can utilize some of the things like there is certain things based in truth even with like a ketogenic diet like not eating carbs yes that can be helpful if you're trying to lose weight because it cuts out an entire macronutrient so yeah it'll, it'll allow you to eat fewer calories more easily and there's just less options in general but that's not the thing that's causing it's still the calories at the end of the day, but people layer it on. Cause like, Oh, and I also have this keto cookbook or keto, you know, ebook or, you know, whatever keto product and, you know, all of that stuff. And there's just so many things that people are overcomplicating in order to get people to believe that they are the one with the answer. And, you know, I guess you can say that about things like religion do. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, I mean, it's, and, and sometimes it's deliberate to, to make money. You have your snake oil salesman, right? And then you have your unwitting snake oil salesman, the people who just convince themselves of something because it makes them feel really good. And, and so they're like, yeah, you want to believe this too, because safety in numbers. And the more people who agree with me, the more right I am. And, and so there, there's that kind of um, unwitting, you know, um, being uh, deceitful without meaning to. I, I, I guess. And, and so for me, I, I, I guess it just, well, somebody had asked on TikTok, they made a video saying, you know, um, what kind of food does an aware or enlightened person eat? To which my response was any food that keeps it alive long enough to get to the next insight. <laughs> That's awesome. I love that. <laughs> and it's, and it's like, and I, I say that because of my own history um, in being in poverty and, and, and going through uh, malnutrition and starvation, I just eat, just get, get that food in you. And I admittedly, like sometimes that food's not the best for you. It's not healthy for you, but it's keeping you going and it's getting you through to that next insight, which is going to change your behavior, which is going to change what you eat and why, and that's going to lead you to another insight. And so it, it just becomes, you know, continue to, to refine your own sensitivity to what feels right for you. Right. And so you can sample different diets, you can sample different things, but it's committing to them as the truth. And that's why people who do that, it doesn't take long. They'll go from one diet to another diet, to another diet, to another diet. Right. And I know for me, um, I've lost about I don't know, probably 35, 40 pounds in like the last year. And it's because um, I was living in an area of Canada where I was higher up in elevation and uh, it was very, very dry. And I had um, asthma problems when I was younger. And so I was having problems breathing and it was getting really bad. And as I was having problems breathing, I was getting less and less active. And I was, of course, I work at home. So it just got out of hand. And, and so there's this video from my daughter's last year birthday. And all of a sudden it pans over and you can just see my, my belly just sticking out through, through right? And, and so all of a sudden I, I just became aware that, oh, wow, I, I really kind of, you know, all of this is, has accumulated and I tried to do something about it, but of course I couldn't breathe. And then, you know, I ended up moving out to Vancouver Island where the air is different. It's way more humid. It's way, way more moist. Immediately I could breathe. And so all of a sudden I, I was walking around more, all of a sudden I was doing things more and I started dropping the weight. And as I dropped the weight, I started getting more active. As I started getting more active, I started getting hungrier, which made me look at what I was eating. And then I ate some things that didn't feel good. And so, and, and that's it, right? It's just continuing on, but it really just comes down to paying attention to it. Like, 
I, I often make the joke that, you know, I decided I was going to jog one day and then I heard somebody clapping behind, behind me and I realized it was my ass cheek flapping onto my leg. <laughs> right? And at that point, I realized I probably need to do something about this. But, but then it's, it's the honest to God priority. It's when you feel hungry. It's recognizing that hunger doesn't necessarily mean you need to eat. Right. And, and, and that's, that's a big one is that we feel this, the discomfort and we want to alleviate it. Cognitive dissonance is very much like dissonance of the stomach. When, when you're hungry, you want to make that discomfort go away in the same way as when you're uncomfortable psychologically, you want to make that comfort go away. But sitting through the discomfort is ultimately what causes the change as with everything. And so, yeah, when I was hungry, I honestly, I would ask myself, well, how much do I really need to eat versus how much do I want? Right. And so I would train myself to eat like half of what I would normally eat. I, and then after a while, it got to the point where I'd be like, you know, I'm just going to drink some water. I don't really need to snack right now and, and, and whatnot. And, and that was it. It just changed as I, as I went. But I'll be honest with you. I, I, I almost regularly constantly forget that I'm in a body at all. So I, I don't pay a great deal of attention when it comes to diet and, and, and routine in terms of exercise and whatnot. I exercise and I, and I eat, but it's as necessary it's as it pops up as it goes across my consciousness i don't i don't have a set discipline or a set structure to it whatsoever though i will say that that my wife is very much responsible for for the nutrition that, that i that i have in my life now because when it was me it was just like you know oh i haven't eaten in two days i should probably go find some hot dogs or something <laughs> right and it's just just because i i spent so long when i was younger being hungry that I learned to tune it out, right? And so all of a sudden you just, you learn to forget it until you're shaking. And you're like, right, I have a body. That body needs sustenance. I should probably do something about that. But yeah, most of the time I, I, don't, I don't actually think of myself as a body at all. <laughs> I don't know if there's many people I could have a conversation with who say things like that. That is pretty incredible, but... Yeah. Wow. I mean, it kind of makes sense knowing you, you know, to the degree that I do, that is not very surprising at the same time. Uh, but it's funny. Yeah. It's that initial question that someone asks you, like, what does an enlightened person eat is just the one of the funniest things too. Cause it's like, you know, whatever you want. And yeah, I don't know. I I'm much more along the lines of, of, finding something that works for you like the best diet for you is the one that you enjoy like it shouldn't be a thing that you suffer through thinking that that's gonna i think people get they overcomplicate it and get over involved in micronutrients and dense nutrient density and while that can be important and it is important to a degree it's not like the it's almost putting the cart before the horse like there's certain steps people have to take like if someone is extremely overweight like eating superfoods might not be the best thing for them if they are very you know calorie dense it might be finding things that can fill them up that they enjoy that aren't super high calorie. And then as they start to shift their, make small shifts in their lifestyle, they can begin incorporating more of like the really like healthy, like natural foods. But if you're prioritizing initially on eating, you know, like natural peanut butter and you're trying to lose weight at the same time and you have a really big appetite, like it's, it's not, it's just like not going to work. And people have, that's another thing. It's like people have different appetites. So, you know, people see a slow, and this is, this is something else I'm pretty passionate about. So I don't know if that's coming off at all, but like there's celebrities out there. And a lot of times females who post these certain like acai fruit bowls with almond butter. And it's like, they might just not have a very big appetite. And so they are able to eat certain types of food and they just don't eat very much of it. But if you're a person who has a very big appetite, eating something like that, that maybe it's a bowl, it's like ends up being 1500 calories, like that might not be what's best for you. And there are certain things that work for some people that don't work for other people. And like you said, it's finding what works 
best for you. And some, I think people just a lot of times when it comes to, you know, weight loss, especially for those who have been trying to, there's a lot of people out there who try for a long time and they just aren't able to, because there is so much shit you have to sift through. And if they were just, you know, told to find something that they enjoy and they're able to figure out how many calories they burn in a day. And they just are able to eat a little bit less than that every day and make sustainable lifestyle changes and not go on a diet. Because if you go on a diet, it means by design, you're going to go off of it at some point. And when you go off of it, all of that, those changes you made are just going to revert back to where you were. And yeah, I don't know. People just, I think they put the cart before the horse and, and, try and take massive steps when if they took smaller steps and made slight changes, they would actually build a sustainable lifestyle around this that isn't so focused on losing 20 pounds in 20 days. And it's more, you know, 20 pounds in a year and it's not as much pressure. And exactly. Yeah, exactly. So, but then yeah. you have to look at yeah. why you're doing it, right? Like, if I am, if I am committed to my idea of myself and I've judged myself for my weight, then I need to see that that change as fast as possible to alleviate the judgment, to alleviate how I'm making myself feel. And so there becomes this need to see changes overnight. And it's because I'm trying to run from my own guilt. I'm trying to run from my own self-judgment. I'm trying to run from my own perceptions, right? And, and so it actually works against us. And then what's interesting is that when you do take your identity out of the way, when you do look at say your weight and you don't think to yourself like, oh God, I'm, and, and you judge yourself for how you look or you judge yourself for, for uh, how you compare to other people, but you actually just make the conscious decision. I don't enjoy struggling like this to get up this hill. You know, I don't, I don't enjoy being out of weight or, or out of breath, you know, doing this extra exercise that I enjoy. And so when you make that choice for, for, positive reasons it has a completely different psychological effect and what i mean is that when we feel guilt or when we're beating ourselves up we stress out and that changes how our body reacts chemically and in a state of stress it's actually harder to lose weight it's hard, harder to metabolize your food it's harder to do the thing that you want to do because you're beating yourself up for doing it or for trying for not doing it and, and so it, it's so important to keep in mind that it's not just the external it's, it's that you are the change. It's exactly the point, right? You're the change. The external is just the scenery that changes with you. And, and so as long as you keep that in mind, everything will just kind of refine itself as you move forward. But it's, it's when we're looking for it outside of ourselves, when we're trying to find that answer externally, that it becomes a need and that need becomes an obsession and that obsession becomes just this deeply ingrained sense of lack and, and, and then hopelessness and despair and it just keeps spiraling downwards and it all starts with overcommitment to the idea of ourself. Yeah, certainly. I think that's an incredibly important perspective to have with all of that too. And it, 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 it applies for anyone also. Like there's so many people and, you know, a lot of times it is females more, but it happens with males as well with eating disorders. Like there are people who are like objectively not like based on their size and weight are not even close to anywhere that's obese. And yet they have this idea of themselves that, and this false perception of themselves that kind of perpetuates that cycle. And they still have this need to like be different when being different or losing weight would actually be detrimental to their health as opposed to beneficial. And it just comes back to that idea and perception of yourself as, as truth. And your idea with things like body dysmorphia too, is like you look in the mirror and you see someone else than everyone else is seeing. And you're you're identifying with that thing that you're seeing and, and identifying with it as truth. And it comes back to so many other things that we discuss and it's just, we can just plug it into this conversation here. And it's like your perception of reality is not reality. And, and that perception is not the truth. Exactly. Exactly. You're the truth without the perception of division. Yeah. You are the truth. I love it. 
Absolutely. So this has been episode eight. And now that we're approaching the two hour mark, we should probably start to wrap up. But um, <laughs> this has been a hell of a week. I mean, between the the supporter only live chat we did yesterday, the workshop that, that we did on Tuesday regarding manifestation, and of course, the, uh, the social anxiety and worry series that's now available on our website as a digital download. There's just so many changes that are that are coming. And I'm very excited because we have some supporters on our Patreon page right now, but then I've mentioned this to you before. I, and I, I have not, I guess you'd call them lofty ambitions without any need to get to them. But if I ever have the capacity to do some of these things, I really, really want to like, um, billboards, giant freaking billboards in cities, just saying things like you're the universe and not putting any branding on it whatsoever, just owning a big billboard just for that message. And, and then just to see what happens in the world, right? Put them in, any, in as many places as we can, um, just to get involved with indigenous communities, to get involved with nonprofits, to be able to, to start to spread or, or normalize unity, sharing for the point of sharing, being for the point of being. And, and so as I see this grow and I see people starting to, to watch us and, and follow us and join us on, on Patreon and whatnot. And, and, and these new series are coming out. And as we continue to go, we're going to cover more and more and more topics from this perspective of clarity. We're just creating more and more ripples. And, and I have to admit that every day I wake up excited to see how many people I get to talk to today. Yeah, me too. And I was actually thinking about just this process that we've had. And uh, I was watching, it was like some YouTube video of some entrepreneur just talking about his, you know, keys to success or something. And I was thinking about like people who start businesses or work on projects, they spend so much time up front, like planning and thinking about it and having this idea. And we basically didn't spend any time up front. There's been time spent obviously now since then but like we have all of these things happening as and it's just like happening as we're going there wasn't any upfront like talking about like there was a tiny bit like hey should we start a podcast together like yeah and then we just started doing it and now we're on episode eight already and there wasn't that upfront and we've learned as we've gone we have we've started doing the workshops now the patreon and and all of it. It's been very cool and just a cool, another testament to just being here and now and just doing things and taking action and not spending so much time fidgeting and, and, you know, questioning and, and, and planning and all of this and just getting into it and doing it. And here we are, you know, however long it's been two months later, pretty much. It's just very cool. It is. Yeah. Cause we're, we're, we're being the change that we're talking about. And we're just expressing it as we change throughout this. And we're listening, or, or rather we're talking and people who are listening to this are changing as they're listening to this. And then they're, they're coming back with feedback, which is causing more change, right? And so I get very excited by not just this conversation that we're having, but how many people are getting involved with it and how many people are enjoying it and, and, and what that means, like how we're, we're going to continue to, to just ripple that outwards. And we very much covered that in our manifestation workshop. And I'm really looking forward to making that publicly available because there are just so many good juicy insights that we're getting into there, uh, just about how, again, we are the change. And uh, we'll end it there on, on that. Do you want to uh, plug anything before we leave? I know that your ebook is going swimmingly. I've been reading it as it's being updated. It's such a good read. Anybody who hasn't read it yet should, de should definitely go and check it out. It's available. It's on sale right now for a limited time. You can find it through um, Stan, and you can also find it through the Dualistic Unity website. Uh, definitely go and check it out. Yeah, appreciate it. Yeah, it's, it's going well. I already, I was planning on up adding like a topic a month, and I already have two more that I thought of today to add about. I was going to add a chapter called... Uh, no expectations, no disappointment. And I have two that I've sort of written about uh, judgment and a specific one about social anxiety to add to. I think there's like 14 topics in there right now. Um, but yeah, it's, it's fairly raw. It's not like the longest book in the world, but I tried to, you know, that's kind of the format that I have my videos in. They're short insights. I kind of think of them as like reminders and it's just a sort of a database you can go back to when you're struggling with something to just remember a few things about, 
you know, the way things are or the way things are not. And so I, I enjoyed writing it and I'm going to enjoy continuing updating it for a while and just continuing to add chapters. So yeah, appreciate it. All right. That's awesome. Yeah, no, it, it's, it's great because it's enough to be a support without being a crutch. And, and I really enjoy that. Like the insights should be short and it should give space for the reader to, to adopt it into their own life and to, and to try and figure out how to use that. You can go almost too far in giving somebody an insight and then giving them like five examples of how that insight works into the point where they're not actually looking for any more examples in their own life. They're just relying on yours, right? So yeah, no, the, the book is coming across really, really well. I'm, I'm really enjoying it. And um, episode eight is done. So episode nine will be next week. And then of course, after our workshop, this time around, we're going to take a small break until after the new year. Um, so if anybody is interested in the January 2022 workshop, we have not decided on the subject as yet. So definitely get in touch with us on social media and let us know what you'd like to hear about. Or better yet, join us on Patreon and you get actually a priority voting right on, on what we're going to talk about in the next workshop. Yeah, looking forward to it. Thank you, everybody. We will see you next week. Bye, everyone.